Well, it looks like we have almost 40 folks joining us. So um, okay. maybe I will begin now. So um, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our first Anthropology Colloquium of the semester. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, but before we get started and before we get too far along, I would like to acknowledge that I am a settler here in North America and that the University of New Mexico, our hosting institution, sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of the land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. Additionally, you all may have noticed that I am in fact not Ian, who was hosting these colloquium last semester. My name is Paulina and I am a graduate student here in the anthropology department. And I'm the first of a number of students who will be helping host these colloquium this semester. I would also like to take this time to remind everyone to please turn off your cameras during the talk as the majority of you have already. Thank you so much and to mute yourself during the talk. Feel free though to please ask questions in the text chat and we'll address those once we get to the end. Today, I am so happy to introduce uh, Dr. Nina G. Jablonski to give her talk titled Human Skin Color is the Product of Evolution and is Important to Talk About. Nina is an Evan Pugh University Professor of Anthropology at the Pennsylvania State University. She is a biological anthropologist and has devoted her career to exploring how primates, including humans, have adapted to their environment. For the last 30 years, she has concentrated on questions not easily answered by the fossil record, such as the evolution of human skin and skin pigmentation, and the ramifications of skin color in modern life, including its implications for health and its connections with concepts of race. Dr. Jablonski has written many peer-reviewed scholarly articles, as well as popular books such as Skin, A Natural History, and Living Color, The Biological and Social Meaning of Skin Color for Adults, as well as Skin We Are In, a children's book for, pardon me, published in South Africa. Dr. Jablonski received her AB in biology at Bryn Mawr College in 1975 and her PhD in anthropology at the University of Washington in 1981. Go Docs! She is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's a recipient of multiple very important fellowships and received an honorary doctorate from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa for her contribution to the worldwide fight against racism. Dr. Jablonski's current research and educational projects include a major educational initiative aimed at promoting youth interest in STEM fields through the study of personal genetic and genealogical ancestry. And with that, we welcome Dr. Jablonski to our digital UNM community. Thank you so much, Paulina. And it's, it's a terrific pleasure to be with you folks at UNM. Um, although I'm sitting here in the middle of central Pennsylvania, I have visited your marvelous campus and been in your department on several occasions, not in recent years, but uh, many times before, and have many treasured colleagues in your department. So thank you for welcoming me. Thank you especially to Ian for originally proffering this invitation to me. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And begin by telling you a little bit about this talk. Uh, this is designed for a department like yours. It doesn't have a lot of, of specific information in human genetics or genomics or uh, human biology. Rather, it's more of a historical survey of what I have done in my studies of the evolution of skin pigmentation and its meanings over the years. This research program started quite accidentally many years ago and has proceeded to sort of mushroom in, in the best of all possible ways. So today's lecture is going to be a, a bit of a, of a sort of an interesting march through my own history but I think it will be useful for you because this topic, human skin pigmentation, is a topic that everyone is interested in, 
most people still don't talk about it. And it has manifold meanings for us around the world, especially in the United States. Over the last several years, I've engaged in a big educational program that has as one of its foci, understanding and educating young people about human physical diversity, including skin color. And I'll bring that in toward the, the end of the lecture. So uh, I, I start with the beautiful series of <clears throat> Pantone portraits. Uh, created by the Brazilian artist Angelica Das, who, like me, shares a fascination with skin pigmentation. And her fascination, like mine, is with the almost insensible differences between individuals when you line them all up next to one another in skin pigmentation. There are no sharp boundaries. There are, there's simply a beautiful gradient or cline of skin color. Angelica Das, the artist, is interested in this from an aesthetic point of view. I am more interested in it from a biological health and social perspective. And so today I want to talk to you about my and others work about skin color as an evolutionary adaptation in the strict sense, about the creation of color-based races and their non-existence in nature, but their durability as fixtures or as I term it, templates in many societies. And lastly, about the importance of education about human physical diversity, including human skin color and race concepts, and how important this is to the future education and socialization of our children. But let's start out with the basics. Humans and other beings on earth have evolved under the sun and Early human evolution took place exclusively in very, very sunny environments of equatorial Africa. All of you will be familiar with a, a picture like this in which the, uh, the range of our close ancestors or close relatives, uh, as well as fossil representatives of the human lineage are shown. Basically, equatorial Africa was the theater of early human evolution and for much of human evolution throughout most of the chronological history of Homo sapiens. It's important that we appreciate this because this was mostly a very sunny environment. So when we look at a, at a beautiful representative, I'll be an exceptional, albeit an exceptional fossil, this, this beautiful specimen of early genus Homo, often referred to the species Homo ergaster, from the western shore of Lake Turkana uh, 1.6 million years ago. This individual is modern in many respects in terms of its uh, limb proportions and probably also in the way he, because he was a young man, in the way he walked and ran around. We've, re we've reconstructed in uh, separate pieces of work of uh, the skin of this individual. We know that physically active mammals have to get rid of excess heat and physically active primates primarily get rid of excess heat through their skin. Humans, and especially early members of the genus Homo, who were far more active in terms of sustained periods of walking and locomotion, had mostly naked skin by the time that the genus Homo began and is well expressed. So this individual we've actually reconstructed to be mostly hairless. If we look at this, what, what is one of my favorite visuals, the hairy timeline of human evolution. On the far left, 
about seven and a half million years ago, we last shared a common ancestor with our close relatives, chimpanzees. But by the time we get along the uh, broadly the lineage of, of hominins to the point of about two to one and a half million years ago, we have visibly less hair on the surface of the body to facilitate thermoregulation, especially heat loss through sweating, and concomitant increases in permanent pigmentation. This was a really, really important transition in human evolution. The evolution of a mostly naked skin that then had to be protected from the exigencies of strong solar radiation, particularly from ultraviolet radiation by added melanin pigmentation. And so here's our lovely reconstruction of early Homo ergaster with mostly naked skin, except the hair on the head and very darkly pigmented skin. Solar radiation at the equator is very strong and it's very strong because it has a high amount throughout the year of shorter wavelength ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet, we hear about a lot from our doctors and in the media and when we buy sunscreen at the, at the drugstore. Ultraviolet radiation comes in many forms and ultraviolet B radiation is particularly important. In this simulation, I show the, the sun and the earth not at scale uh, and the different wavelengths of ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun down to the earth. Now at the equator, which I'm showing here, UVC very, very short wavelength, highly energetic UV is completely absorbed by the atmosphere. But a significant amount of UVB, which is highly active uh, to, or highly reactive uh, of living uh, organisms, penetrates through the atmosphere, as does a large amount of UVA. The longer wavelength, uh, the longer wavelengths of UV that travel more or less uh, uh, similarly to visible light through the atmosphere. So suffice it to say, the equator gets uh, year-long high doses of UVB and UVC with only minor fluctuations. We've expressed this in a few different ways. When we started our work, and I should say we, the royal we here, is uh, my primary collaborator and partner, uh, George Chaplin, who has worked on the GIS and spatial statistics behind all of our work on, on the evolution of skin pigmentation. Years ago, when we started working on this problem, we acquired data sets from NASA that allowed us to create comprehensive maps like the one that you see in front of you, expressing annual average ultraviolet radiation. In the way that NASA's remote satellites have collected the data, this is primarily a map of UVB strength on average during the year. And what we can appreciate immediately looking at this map is that the highest areas of UV shown here in hot pink and, and red are at the equator. And there's a large portion of equatorial Africa here, which has, and the Horn of Africa, which has very, very high levels of annual UV. Significantly, we see that cloudier portions of Africa, as well as other continents, even if they're at the equator, have lower UV levels. And certainly, as we get out of the tropics and into far northern and far southern latitudes, we see UV dropping off precipitously. Note also, something that is extremely important later in this lecture, which is 
that the hemispheres are not created equal with respect to land mass or distribution. So there's a very large fraction of the northern hemisphere that is actually in very low UV zones. And this has dramatic implications for, for the adaptations, the biological and cultural adaptations of humans dispersing into those zones later on in our story. So in early Homo, as I said, we have a mostly hairless body and darkly pigmented skin. The pigment eumelanin is a marvelous natural protective sunscreen. It is a long polymer that has the ability to absorb visible light, which is why it appears very, very dark brown or nearly black. And it also can absorb tremendous amounts of ultraviolet radiation throughout the wavelength span of ultraviolet. So it's a really amazing pigment. It also has the ability chemically to absorb reactive oxygen species that are created when ultraviolet radiation impinges on biological systems. So it's one of these comprehensively remarkable polymers in nature that is used slavishly to help impart color as well as protection to many different kinds of organisms. And what we have posited, and again, I'm not going to provide a lot of details from our publications, but rather simply summarize to say that, that we have inferred, and by this point in history, proven that the primary selective force for the evolution of darkly pigmented skin is not protection against skin cancer, which was mooted early uh, in the late 20th century, but rather it is primarily for protection against the destruction of the essential vitamin folate. Folate is a vitamin that we get normally from uh, green vegetables, citrus fruits, whole grains, and it is absolutely essential for the replication and modification and repair of DNA. In other words, it's essential for all processes in the body requiring cell replication or repair of DNA, such as occurs after a, a, a serious uh, bout of uh, sun or other kinds of radiation. Folate, as I say, is, is gotten from this whole range of vegetables and is important in this slew of processes that we take for granted. Right now, you need folate to help maintain your, your tissues that are constantly undergoing turnover, such as in the linings of your mouth and intestine. And it's also really important for helping to control the processes of vasodilation in the periphery of our circulatory system. In other words, it helps in thermoregulation as we bring more blood or less blood to our surface or away from our surface, depending on the external temperature and the level of exercise. So when we think about, about the great hairy timeline here of human evolution, we're thinking about basically a continuous process in the evolution of the genus Homo from, from moderately to deeply pigmented skin. And although we don't have fossilized skin, we have certainly good genetic inferences that humans were and mostly hairless and darkly pigmented by about 1 million years ago. And all humans evolving in equatorial Africa, including and importantly, the earliest members of Homo sapiens, anatomically modern people, were darkly pigmented. All of our early species evolution, Homo sapiens evolution, 
if we take it as beginning around 300,000 years ago and proceeding up to the present day, most of that evolutionary period has been spent only in Africa and entirely with people who were darkly pigmented to various shades. I'll adumbrate on that in, in just a few minutes, but it's an important point to make because this is the ancestral condition for Homo sapiens and other conditions that we see developing later in the course of her human dispersals occur later as a result of other genetic changes that I'll elaborate upon. Oops, sorry. So here's the early genus Homo and Homo sapiens, as I just said. So uh, a modern African person uh, is really, this is, this is us. This is how we looked uh, throughout much of our history. And it's important for many reasons to emphasize that humans became modern in every respect, not only in their integument, but in their symbolic culture, in their linguistic abilities, in their artistic abilities, in their technological abilities, while we were evolving in Africa. But clearly, there are people who have less melanin, less eumelanin pigmentation in their skin. Uh, the woman on the right is from Western Europe and clearly has much less melanin in her skin. This is not the ancestral condition for our species. This is a derived condition that is actually a, a condition of loss of pigmentation under the influence of natural selection. When we think about the great map of, of UV relative to the pattern of Homo sapiens dispersals, we see that humans started, Homo sapiens started dispersing, and there's all sorts of, of course, changing dates for the beginnings of these dispersals uh, out into the Afro-Arabian Peninsula and then back and then elsewhere. But we'll just simplify things and keep the arrows to a minimum and say that basically people started moving out from the Afro-Arabian Peninsula 60 to 70,000 years ago and thence into Southeast Asia 50 to 60,000 years ago into Western Europe and then Northeastern Asia 30 to 50,000 years ago, and then again, much later into the new world. One of the important points that has been made by many workers, more recently Brenna Hen, uh, is that at many of these junctures, when humans, for instance, uh, crossed into the Afro-Arabian Peninsula, or when groups dispersed into Australia or into Western Europe or into the Americas from Northeastern Asia, that these were small populations and that these were genuine bottleneck events. This actually makes a big difference to the genetic diversity that we see in these populations today and to the ways in which they have adapted to different levels of ultraviolet radiation. Because these groups dispersing to different places had different complements of skin pigmentation genes, as well as other genes. It's salutary to remember that humans in prehistory didn't travel much, no vacations. They spent most of their time outdoors and most of it without sewn clothing. So even though they may have used skins, and no doubt they did use skins a lot uh, in prehistory, possibly for hundreds of thousands of years, sewn clothing uh, didn't exist for much of that time. And humans, because they were outside most of the time doing stuff outdoors, 
skin was the primary interface between their bodies and the outside environment. And that means that their skin had to withstand the seasonal vicissitudes, not only of heat and cold, but in strength of solar radiation and ultraviolet radiation. So let's think about populations that are dispersing into the far northern hemisphere and look at the same UV simulation. Again, UVC is not relevant to our discussion today because it's entirely absorbed. UVB is also entirely absorbed in the winter time. We all appreciate this right now in the middle of winter because even you in New Mexico uh, except at very high altitudes, you are receiving no UVB in your sunshine right now. So you can spend a lot of time outdoors. You will receive UVA and may even get a sun tan or a sun burn as a result of UVA exposure, but you won't get any UVB. This turns out to be a critical part of the story because these wavelengths have specific activities on the human body. These two guys who are pretty much the same in, in every aspect of their, of their uh, basic biology differ in the amount of eumelanin in their skin. The man on the left has much less, the man on the, the right has much more. And as a result, they actually absorb different amounts of UVB into their skin. The man on the right, because he has more eumelanin, does not absorb very much at all because of this marvelous natural sunscreen that he has in his epidermis that prevents the absorption and biological action of UVB on his body. Whereas the man on the left has much less and he has much more UVB penetrating into his skin. This makes a big difference because UVB catalyzes vitamin D formation in human skin. So light skin is, is depigmented skin, properly speaking, and light skin with less eumelanin facilitates vitamin D production. So when we, again, look at our map here, what we see is far less UVB, uh, especially in these northern latitudes of Eurasia and North America, and the peoples who disperse into these areas evolve cultural and biological adaptations. This is a real anthropological problem because they not only undergo genetic changes to promote genes that contribute to loss of eumelanin pigmentation and that enhance vitamin D production in the skin, but they also engage in all sorts of cultural processes to make sure that they get more vitamin D rich foods. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but there's a lot of spectacular archeology span that pertains here to the harvesting of vitamin D rich foods using harpoons and all sorts of interesting spears and so forth. And this turns out to be an evolutionary biologist field day because when we look at modern people today who live at, in high latitude environments, Western Europe or North, Northeastern Asia, we know that they have lightly pigmented or depigmented skin. What we didn't know until about 15 years ago was that they evolved this similar skin phenotype or appearance through genetically independent means or mostly independent. When we look at the genes that actually underpin pigmentation or depigmentation in these, in these lineages, we see that for the most part, 
these lineages have different suites of genes that have contributed to loss of eumelanin pigmentation. This, as I say, is an evolutionary biologist field day because evidence of parallel evolution really uh, strengthens potential inferences of natural selection acting to bring about the same phenotype under the same environmental conditions. So we have proposed and others have uh, provided evidence that the primary selective force for the evolution of depigmented skin is promotion of ultraviolet induced vitamin D production. And higher latitudes, much less intense summer, much more strongly seasonal UVB and lower vitamin D potential all around. People living at the highest latitudes must eat vitamin D rich foods in their diet because otherwise they cannot sustain healthy levels of vitamin D in their circulation, even if they're outdoors all summer long. Vitamin D has enormous importance. It's gotten a lot of press in recent years and many of you may have been urged by your physicians uh, or healthcare provider to, to get more to vitamin D somehow because vitamin D is important to the absorption of calcium from foods. So it's important to the, to the development and maintenance of a healthy skeleton and teeth. Uh, nutritional rickets being the, the classic disease that results from an absence of vitamin D during early development. This is particularly serious uh, if it affects young women during their skeletal development and if it's sustained for long periods of time because the pelvic outlet is deformed, thus precluding normal vaginal diver, uh, uh, delivery. In recent years though, a lot of attention has been spent on non-classical functions of vitamin D, especially the functions in strengthening innate and acquired immunity. This turns out probably to be one of the most important functions that is relevant in the modern world because vitamin D deficiency turns out to be incredibly important in determining susceptibility to a variety of infectious as well as chronic diseases involving inflammation. So we also need to think about what happens when groups of people move from a mid or high latitude environment and in, back into low latitudes. Well, not surprisingly, we see an evolution of repigmentation. And now in a new sort of surge of, of genetic studies focusing on the evolution of pigmentation in Austronesian populations, we're seeing beautiful genetic work indicating that as populations that had lost pigmentation redisperse back into high UV, more tropical latitudes, that they gain pigmentation via different genetic mechanisms than they originally had it. Again, one of the coolest things from an evolutionary biologist perspective and something that suggests that there is a lot of, of sort of genetic depth. There are many genes that control pigmentation pathways that can be modified subtly along many parts of the pigmentation pathway to alter what the final phenotype is. In other words, we can get to the same color end point by a variety of different genetic and biochemical and physiological mechanisms. So cool. So when we look at these three guys, one from East Africa, 
one from Australia and one from Southern India with remarkably similar skin colors who have evolved their skin pigmentation by at least partly independent means, especially in the case of the person on the far right in Southern India. And although we don't have very much data on Australian Aboriginal populations, we now know for Melanesian populations that dark pigmentation is imparted primarily by genes that are different from those that impart dark pigmentation to people in equatorial Africa. So again, a very interesting set of mechanisms. Dark and highly tannable skin evolved multiple times independently, including in the new world. And Again, uh, many genetic loci are involved. I like to say perhaps too loosely for the geneticists in the room that, that we have a, a wide artistic palette of skin pigmentation genes that have been used at different times and places. And the nature of the variation in those genes has often been dictated by the population bottlenecks through which specific populations have passed in their history. So there's a, a lovely element of chance as well as repeated uh, natural selection that has entered into these processes. So we can really think of skin pigmentation as being a, a lovely evolutionary compromise between the demands of photoprotection under very strong UV at the equator and the demands of photosynthesis of vitamin D closer to the poles. I often like to, to tell people, especially as we approach uh, the Darwin Day 2021, that if you need an example of evolution to teach about in your classroom, try this one because it's the best example or certainly one of the best examples of natural selection acting on the human body. And it's something that all students can relate to. Importantly also, uh, to mention to students and to everybody is that skin pigmentation evolved mostly independently of other traits. Although some skin pigmentation genes also influence eye and hair color, many of the genes that, that importantly influence skin pigmentation do not influence other aspects of the visible phenotype. In other words, there are lots of people with light and with dark skin who have a dark skin or light skin for entirely different genetic reasons. And for reasons apart from those that might have dictated their hair texture, eye color, relative limb length and so forth. So again, similar skin colors evolving independently multiple times implies that they cannot be used as markers of, of phylogenetic unity or racial identity. It's a beautiful adaptive characteristic that reflects similar solar conditions experienced by ancestors of living groups, but this does not make for, uh, for phyletic or evolutionary unity of groups and certainly not for the creation of color-based races. Here's Angelica Das's beautiful spectrum of human skin color with no room for dental floss between the colors. But of course, humans do see color and color has meaning and color has been given meaning. When people say that they're colorblind, uh, they may in fact have genetically based colorblindness, but most of us don't. And we have beautiful primate trichromatic color vision. 
we see color, we notice color. Color is important part of our environment and we notice human skin color. And human skin color, because it is so visible, uh, has been one of the major focal points of interest uh, in, in centuries past for grouping people into different groups. Although we tend to think about these in racial groups, they weren't always signified as races. But pertinent to our discussion here, a brief history for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the origin of human races. Um, these are creations of 18th century natural history and philosophy. I'm going to single out just two of the major players here, uh, Carol, Carl Linnaeus, the systematist, and Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, because they played important but slightly different roles in the designation of human types and races. Linnaeus, and in both cases, skin color was used to define the groups that they signified. Linnaeus initially started out just having continental groups that were given uh, names, Europeus, and place, obviously, and skin color. Europeans were Alba or white, Americans were Ruba or red, Asiaticus, Fuscus or brown, Africanus, Niger or black. That's how he placed it, and it was in no particular order, as he indicated. But just a few years after this, oops, oops sorry, oh, sorry, it went backwards instead of forwards. My apologies. Just a few years after, in 1758, we see Linnaeus taking on some baggage from uh, Greek philosophers and from explorers' accounts of travels throughout Africa and Eurasia. And to his original designation of Europeans Alba, he also adds these characterizations of personality and morality. So he's talking about sanguine and rigid Europeans, red and choleric and upright Americans, lurid, melancholy and rigid Asians, and phlegmatic and lax Africans. This uh, harkens back to the climatic theory of Hippocrates and others from the fifth century BC onwards in classical Greece echoed in many ways the climatic theory of how the sun, especially the strength of the sun, influences not only the physical makeup, but also the emotional makeup and the ability of people to, uh, to think clearly, develop complex uh, codes of morality and as we'll see in just a moment, develop civilization. Kant, Immanuel Kant, the famous German philosopher, uh, famously thought about human physical diversity and mental diversity very, very carefully for decades. Many people are unaware of the extremity of his, of his thinking in, uh, in human diversity, but he was genuinely interested in this. And he concluded on the basis of the evidence at hand, albeit no travel on his part, but simply gathering literature and travelers accounts, that there were four groups that he deliberately called races. And in contradistinction to Linnaeus, these races were in a hierarchical order. So the race of the whites clearly was uh, superior to the other three races. And this was echoed by Kant's contemporary David Hume in Scotland and became a very, very powerful construct at the end of the 18th century. 
a time when it had enormous, and some would argue disproportionate influence on the founding of the colonies and the fledgling United States. The Kantian view really upheld that races were not only physically different, but they were culturally distinct and that people had different capacities for reasoning and for the development of what Kant, Kant saw as civilized behavior. And the white race was clearly superior. What we see, and I've developed this elsewhere in, in my writing, what we see is that named races at the end of the 18th and into the early 19th century become very durable templates for describing human variation. And it doesn't escape very many people that this is the same time when the transatlantic slave trade is not only going strong, but is being threatened by abolitionist uh, perspectives and movements in the UK, in Europe, and in the United States. But according to many of the upholders of slavery, it's not so bad if you are enslaving people who are biologically inferior. Again, this is something that we find abhorrent and antithetical to even discuss today, but this was considered common knowledge and accepted wisdom of the time. The key point that I'm making is that these templates of ideology in philosophy decisively affect how human biological var variation is studied and how people think of one another to this very day. We can think of this simple sort of con the continuum from race definitions that were associated with color, such as those of Linnaeus, going to racial stereotypes that were really hardened after Kant and Hume uh, had, uh, had their own go at them, developing into what I call color memes and psychosocial templates for racism that become very, very hardened and increasingly destructive throughout the mid 20th century. But I would argue that we needn't be trapped in these durable templates and that we can think about and we can educate about human physical diversity, genetic diversity, and human races very differently. And this is jumping into the educational part of, of my activities for the last few years. Um, I've had the good fortune since 2007 to work with uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Skip Gates, uh, as he's often known, and a, a host of other colleagues. Some of you may also uh, recognize the name Mark Weiss from the National Science Foundation, who is very uh, instrumental in getting us going on this journey uh, back in 2007 and 2008. Anyway, we assembled a group of scholars who thought that we can do something better based in part on our, our understanding of science, but also based on Skip's experience in seeing how transformative information on genetics and genealogy would be to people. He famously has a program called Finding Your Roots uh, that has, was preceded uh, several years ago by other programs where he deals with the uh, genetic and genealogical heritage of various celebrity guests. People have remarkable discoveries and epiphanies. And he came to me in 2007 and he said, Nina, we can do this. We can do this more widely. We can do this for kids. And I said, yeah, I think we can, but it's going to be a lot of work. And it has been, but I would venture to say that it's proving to be worth it. 
We were able to get this group together, and here I'm telescoping a whole lot of, of, of activity and workshops and grant writing into just a few minutes. We got this group together and we managed to get some important funding uh, from several different foundations that allowed us to be able to take what we called a sort of a fledgling genetics and genealogy curriculum into some pilot programs. And we created some summer camps for middle school aged youth and we relied heavily on the, the so-called Science U summer camp program run at Penn State. We also ran genetics and genealogy modules in undergraduate biology classes at Spelman College, Morehouse, and a few of the other historically black colleges and universities. And we've provided uh, a few years later, extensive outreach material via documentaries and published uh, online teaching materials uh, for, for members of the public. Basically, we took all of these academic people with their highfalutin ideas and said, okay, how can we make this work with a bunch of kids? And we chose middle school age kids as sort of a, a test group because we thought kids who are in that roughly sort of 10 to 13, nine to 13 year old range are trying to make sense of the world and themselves. And they're very keen on understanding how they fit into their peer group. And so we thought, let's, let's try them. They're going to know quite a bit. They're going to be interested, but not jaded. And this would be a good uh, age group in which to, to try out this curriculum approach. And so we developed uh, initially a two-week summer camp curriculum in which personal DNA ancestry and genealogy and the nature of human variation was explored in, in a variety of fun ways. Kids extracted fruit DNA, their own DNA. They, uh, they also had their own 23andMe ancestry results from which we excerpted uh, specific genes and visible phenotypes that they could look at and compare with one another. We were extremely attentive to privacy issues because all of the students that we were dealing with were under 13. And the students also did uh, explorations into their own personal genealogies or into the genealogies of famous people. We had several adoptive children in our research programs uh, because we wanted to work with adoptive children as well. And we made sure that they had equally meaningful kinds of activities to engage in. And we had kids not only look at their ancestry, but see where the ancestors lived and when the ancestors had actually come to the United States. Some in the far distant uh, distance of American history, some more recently. And we had kids study one another in obvious characteristics like skin color. This turned out to be a lot of fun and really, really interesting for kids because they could compare one another and then think about the genes that might have contributed to these different appearances of their skin. And we had kids do independent research projects for one day during their, uh, during their two week program. Actually, it turned out to be about one and a half days. And they did their own independent studies. And much to our delight, they did it. They, they, and they felt empowered to, uh, to get on with being scientists. They loved having the responsibility of being scientists. They were scientists with pride. We joined with our local public broadcasting affiliate, WPSU, in late 2016 and 2017 because they said, hey, these middle school camp things, this is really good stuff that you're doing. We think that we can make some good programs out of this. 
with uh, some marvelous direction from uh, WPSU, from these two super uh, producers, Christian Berg and Shireen Stanford, here flanking Skip Gates, uh, we created a series of nine webisodes, <coughs> pardon me, that are now actually going to be aired as proper full-length documentaries, but they now exist on the on the web as as educational web webisodes of eight to 10 minutes each that deal with uh, our curriculum and how we rolled it out. It's called Finding Your Roots, The Seedlings. So it's really an, an, an offshoot of Skip's main public broadcasting program. And there are some of the kids that were part of our documentary program. If you go to our home screen of www.fyrclassroom.org, this is what you'll see. And you can click on the series, the curriculum or the at home, which is especially for uh, COVID classrooms. And you can get everything, well, not everything, but you can get a lot of material. Uh, the different webisodes are all there uh, that and the, they're labeled by content so you can watch one or binge watch the whole series and you can download the whole curriculum or customize it in different modules it's 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 all there for the taking we're proud of this and we were really happy to see that over the years we actually garnered three Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards because these are highly effective uh, teaching and edutainment uh, productions. These are available at that website and they will, uh, they're also uh, the sort of a longer version of the video is also available on the NSF uh, STEM for All uh, website, which is one of the main NSF websites for STEM education. And what we saw was uh, we, we surveyed these young people a lot before and after, and we're still following up with them. We see a lot of these students who took the excitement and feeling of self-empowerment from the camp activities into self-directed research programs that they've actually continued uh, to this present day. And we have had a few exceptional examples of kids who have taken what they learned in summer camp and then taught it to younger groups of up and coming students in their own school or in the school from which they graduated. And here one of our graduates on the right is teaching a group of kids from her former middle school. So the question that, that sort of flavored our curriculum, who am I, becomes who I am. And what we're working on now is the tremendous expansion of this program with the support of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and specifically the Biointeractive Educational Wing will be expanding these curriculum offerings to high school and undergraduate modules that will be made freely available through the HM HHMI Biointeractive website and others. All materials, again, freely distributed. We're very pleased about this because this really, in our opinion, is the first step to getting out of the templates in which we have found ourselves for centuries. Thanks a lot. I've really enjoyed being with you and I hope that we still have some time for questions. I noticed that we're right on the hour. I apologize for taking too long in speaking. Not a problem at all. Thank you so much, Nina, for joining us. Um, let me just end your screen share really quickly. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll do the stop share on my side. Wonderful. There we go. Um, and so thank you so much for everyone joining us. It is 11 o'clock. And so if you um, cannot stay with us, um, I totally understand. Um, but Nina, if you have time um, and if folks wanna hang around, um, I was gonna leave it open for questions for about 15 minutes. Um, so let me double check the chat to see if anyone asks anything in there. Wonderful. Um, so Nicole Thomas, 
said, um, Nina, what types of evidence allowed us to put together the hairy timeline that you showed? <laughs> yes, um, it's, it's a lovely uh, combination of evidence that we've used. Actually, when you go to our original publication on this from 2000, we had exclusively sort of physical evidence. We inferred from skeletal evidence that humans who were like the, like the skeleton I showed, sort of long, lanky uh, individuals who from study of their joints in the lower limb and pelvis uh, were clearly uh, energetic, habitual bipeds who engaged in striding bipedal locomotion and some running. In other words, they created a lot of muscular heat. We inferred from that physical evidence that humans must have been mostly hairless and that ecrine sweating would have been essential for their, uh, for keeping cool, especially with relatively large brains that are, that are temperature sensitive. We made that inference before uh, Alan Rogers and his group at the University of Utah in 2004 published an article using genetic evidence to show that basically humans probably were completely or functionally hairless by about 1.2 million years ago, if not earlier, because it was at that point that you can actually see that the modern configuration of one particular gene, the melanocortin one receptor gene, uh, begins to, well, is, is, exists uh, in the human lineage. And so it was, I can say honestly, a combination of inference from paleontology and paleoecology initially, then subsequently added to uh, genetic evidence that created the hairy timeline. Wonderful, that's so great. Um, so that was the only um, question we had in the chat, but Benjamin um, Gerstner um, has a question. And if anyone else has questions, feel free to, um, once Benjamin um, has asked his and Nina has answered, to um, unmute yourself and turn on your video if you would like to ask your question yourself. Benjamin? Great. Thank you. Uh, Nina, absolute phenomenal work. Um, I, I wasn't familiar with this. I'm actually from the biology department at UNM. Um, I'm oh, cool. a plant evolutionary biologist, so hey. coming into it a little bit different. Um, but I think the kind of the, the main question that I have is you, you talk about uh, the population bottlenecks and yeah. kind of the evidence for that. And I was wondering, so you, you know, the, the program that you put out for middle schoolers, incredible. I so, so motivated by that. But I was wondering if there's any specific resources kind of linking that to be able to, as you said, use it as an example for undergraduate and maybe even graduate classes. So, you know, is there kind of a, a specific you know, suite of work on the phylogeography of those population bottlenecks, kind of estimates of those. And then yes. are there any other traits that you've seen that go along with kind of the selection on uh, skin pigmentation? Yeah, um, a great question, Benjamin. Um, there is now a lot of information on the nature and extent of these bottlenecks to the extent that, you know, if you look in the population genetics literature, just go into PubMed or, you know, Google Scholar from the last 10 years and you put in human population bottlenecks, you'll get this whole slew of stuff. Now, a lot of these traits that have been affected by the bottlenecks are, are sort of invisible, but some of them are, you know, clearly visible. Uh, one of my students is working on genes and phenotypes determining uh, skin texture, and, sorry, hair texture and hair curl. And almost certainly these genes were affected profoundly by bottlenecks and then possibly also by selective mechanisms. So, you know, I, there, there are now more and more studies. And if you, if you look you know, again, I, I urge you to go to the, you know, to one of these search engines because more of these studies are connecting these bottlenecks to not only 
physical visible traits, but also invisible traits and to uh, genetic predispositions to disease or simply predispositions to being somewhat different from the next population next door. I mean, this is, this is sort of old hat for population geneticists because they dealt with uh, population bottlenecks in the case of the American Amish, for instance, for, you know, for half a century or more. But now we're able to see this on a much broader scale because of all of the, you know, the, the genetic and genomic surveys that have been done on populations worldwide. So, you know, I think this becomes a very powerful tool for teaching students because it, it basically allows people to understand, okay, humans underwent all of these bottlenecks just like other animals and other plant and plants did, you know, at various times. And many populations became extinct. You know, there's one of these, one of the amazing things that, I mean, archaeology and genetics show us is that many populations of Homo sapiens became extinct in the late Pleistocene and, you know, at around the time of the last glacial maximum. So this wasn't just a problem for, you know, some big herd animals and some big trees living in Northern Europe. It was, it was a, a big global problem. So I think this is, this is extremely exciting for anyone teaching, you know, evolutionary biology and ecology, because you can see these global landscapes of genetic change and how they've affected the subsequent evolutionary trajectories of these lineages. And in the case of humans, it becomes really inter particularly interesting because by the time they're going through most of these bottlenecks, they're very culturally competent. They've got tools, they can alter their diet, they can, you know, make sort of stuff to cover themselves, they can make shelters. You know, so uh, most other organisms don't have the benefit of, of being able to augment their biology with all of these cultural trappings. So that makes a really exciting thing to, you know, to discuss with students is like, why can humans do what they do today? Well, you know, mm, several tens of thousands of years ago, they were able to sort of pull all this stuff together and make all this kit. And they ended up, you know, on this island and at this latitude doing this, that, and the other thing. And although some plants and animals end up getting the same places by accident, we have gotten there by design. Thank you very so much for that answer. Yeah, and Nicole has another question. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for that. Nicole has another question. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for that. Sure. Hi, Nina. Thank you so much for joining us and presenting for us today. I so enjoyed your talk. It was so wonderfully clear. Thank you Good. and fascinating. Um, so I was curious along the lines. So in the United States, of course, we typically, people typically refer to people of color as my, in being in the minority. And I was curious. I understand that the spectrum of pigmentation is difficult to put into any kind of categories, but is there a, a worldwide, are we able to do some kind of worldwide distribution to kind of show what end of the spectrum is in fact a minority? I have the expectation. <laughs> I, I, I love your question, Nicole. And in fact, you know, I, I'm working with a group from the uh, British Association of Dermatologists um, for the express reason of, 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 well, that gets to the purport of your question. Basically all of, or much of modern thinking, Western thinking is, and including Western thinking in biomedicine has been framed by the idea that, that Europeans and lightly pigmented Europeans are dominant, are more numerous, uh, and also happen to be culturally superior. Uh, and what we now recognize is that we really had, had it wrong. We had it so badly wrong. And now various groups, of course, are trying to walk this back. 
and walk it back in a constructive way, by way of, of not only saying we got this wrong, but let's think about this entirely differently with respect to the sort of the average skin color of people on earth and how we should talk about people. Uh, I mean, the, it, it appalls me that we still in the biomedical literature still use the word Caucasian uh, in an outrageously, well, a lot. And, and that these words perfuse the literature and are taken as the norm. So that's by way of saying there are major institutional moves afoot to change the way that we think about normal humans, what they look like, what their color is, and how they should be referred to. But it's going to take years, decades, or longer for us to really functionally change this situation. Progress will be made with every funeral and retirement, uh, as it is often in, in fields. And we will have to wait for a generational change. But we also need conscientious programs of education that help us make this change so that the young people coming up uh, will think differently about about human diversity. This is within our grasp, but we all have to make an effort. And I am hopeful that now with a new administration in Washington, that we might have even some, some more uh, high level government support for such uh, a movement in this country. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has questions, we've got a couple more minutes. Um, Nina, I would also like to say one of the one of my uh, favorite things that you mentioned in your talk near the end um, when you were talking about working with middle school students was this idea of being interested but not jaded. And I think that <laughs> yes. that's something that um, seeing um, seeing talks like yours and, and the plethora of, of cool talks that have um, come out in the last year um, has really made me uh, want to do that myself um, as, as, as someone in academia. And I think it's such an um, important sentiment to to um, to keep even amongst ourselves. And, you know, one of the things that, that is empowering here, I think we all see this as very daunting. How do we change an educational system? But everyone has an interest in doing this. And it, I was able to sort of uh, channel my interest simply by, by getting a lot of like-minded people together so that we shared the, the thinking and the burden of development. And in this way, you know, none of us was inordinately burdened, but we managed to pull it all together. Admittedly, it took some years to do, um, but we, we made it all together and we're sort of going forward like one of those, you know, multi-legged creatures that, you know, we're, we're getting there. And it's, and it's really a nice feeling. It's, it is worth a try. And all of us can contribute in some way. I think that's a wonderful sentiment to end on. So thank you all for joining us for our first anthropology colloquium. And thank you once again, Dr. Jablonski for joining us this week. Um, we'll have another, another colloquium next week. I don't know who will be hosting it. Maybe it will be Ian, maybe it'll be another student. Um, but thank you all so much for being here and for joining us and have a great rest of your Friday. Thank you very much for inviting me again. It's been great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Stay everyone. safe and healthy. Of course. Yep. Stay healthy, everyone.